Who, Lordy? How is... How, how is this even possible? Like, I, I... I've read bad books before, but I don't believe I have ever read any that were quite this... clumsy. Like, I... I didn't even know it was possible to do that. This is the introduction song. It's not very good, but it's not too long. So I'm really not joking when I say that. Like, this is not the worst book I've ever read. I'll, I'll be clear on that from the beginning. Like, I've read stuff that made me a lot angrier or stuff that was a lot stupider, but I have never read anything that's quite this poorly put together with the exception of maybe Reaper's Creek, which, remember, is one of Onision's books. Like, th this is about on that level. So just for context, Fallen is a six-book-long series, which I reviewed a while ago. You can check it out here. Um, and that entire series, I used 282 tabs to get through. Like, that's how many notes I had to make. Zenith... I used 304. <laughs> this is one book. This is nuts. I have never in my life found something that's this dense with just so many little inconsistencies and bad lines and bizarre character actions, repetitions. I, th repetition is a big thing. Like, there's so many parts where characters repeat old motivations or go over the same problems again, or we get a flashback which deals with the same stuff we've already dealt with before. It's it's weird. And part of the reason why there's so many tabs here is that it's kind of bad in multiple ways at once. Like, there will be sections that I'll go like four, five, six pages even without putting a single tab down, and then I'll have like five on one page because... <laughs> Well, there's just so much all at once. Like, it'll, it'll be something that is kind of stupid in terms of foreshadowing and also kind of stupid in terms of character motivation because it wouldn't make sense for them to do that and also kind of stupid in terms of the world structure. And so it's, it's layered is the thing. It's bad in layered ways, like an onion. And the thing is, reading this, you can definitely tell it was written by two people because it feels simultaneously unfocused and like it's going in different directions at the same time. Which, I mean, I guess that's just another way of being unfocused, but whatever. The point is, it was written by booktubers, uh, Sasha Alsberg and Lindsay Cummings. Uh, I don't actually know what their channels are called. I've never watched them or anything. But I have to ask, like, how could people who, like, talk about books that much and presumably read a lot, how could they be this bad and how? Now, I'll bring up real quick that two years ago when this book first came out, it did get a lot of negative reviews, for good reason, you'll see, uh, and there was some drama surrounding that. I'm not going to talk about that because I don't care. Uh, that, that, that's the main reason. Like, I'm, I'm a grown-ass man. I, I don't give a shit about that sort of thing. And also because I'm really not trying to attack the authors here. Like, th their book is terrible, but I don't know them as people. They're probably perfectly nice and all that, so just let's focus on the book. I really don't want to get into anything else. Um, I will say, though, that even if this isn't the worst book I've ever read, it's the worst attempt at a space opera I have ever come across. If you're unfamiliar, space operas are essentially the science fiction equivalent of epic fantasy. It's something that is really large in scale, usually has a large cast of characters, um, there's usually uh, the fate of the entire universe at, uh, at stake. Not necessarily, but usually. So, you know, it's something big like that. It, if you like epic fantasy, you might also like space opera, I don't know. And this certainly tries to be that, but it fails in every possible way. It's not the worst science fiction I've ever come across, because as long as Maximum Ride Forever exists, it's, um... <laughs> I, I don't know if anything is gonna beat that one out. But hey, who knows? But what's this book actually about? Well, it's about a fugitive mercenary by the name of Androma Rossella, also known as the Bloody Baroness, who travels around doing jobs with her crew aboard their ship called the Marauder. One day, Androma gets the opportunity to atone for her crimes and no longer be a fugitive and finally go home and stop living this life. So she agrees to do it, they go off and do the job, and then it pulls them into this much bigger conflict, which is the main story. 
That sounds fine at first, but honestly the cracks begin to show before the book even really starts. Because at the beginning of this book there is a map, I'll see if I can find one to put up here, uh, a map of the Mirabelle Galaxy, which is where everything takes place. And I'm not opposed to having maps at the beginning of books, in fact I think it's usually a good thing, uh, especially if it's a fantasy setting where there's, you know, it's a whole new world with a ton, ton of different countries and stuff, but for sci-fi, I'm not really sure what the point is. Like, you can just say, yeah, we go to this planet, or we go to this space station, and really all you need to know is how far things are apart in relation to one another. And showing the Mirabelle galaxy in this manner is, well, all the systems are really closely jammed together, so we don't really get a sense of scale. Uh, we don't see any markings indicating, like, different countries or anything, so we have no idea of the political situation. <laughs> We have no feeling on what the culture is like, nothing like that. In fact, I'm not even totally sure if it's our world in the future, which a lot of science fiction is, in fact most science fiction is, because for some reason it's just, yeah, at some point in the next couple hundred years people on Earth get technology and go out and start colonizing stuff, uh, but sometimes, occasionally, you will see something that is just a totally fictional made-up world, kind of like uh, Star Wars, you know, it's, it's space, but it has nothing to do with Earth or humanity as we know it. And so, th this sort of thing, like, it, it, the map just does nothing for us. Like, for example, Wheel of Time, when I first read uh, the first book in the series, Eye of the World, I opened it up, looked at the map, said, wow, this world is really big, I can see all these different countries, I can see there's a bunch of areas that are not belonging to any country, which is kind of weird, I wonder what's going on there, and then, um, when we get introduced to the characters and where they live, we realize, man, they really only know about this tiny, tiny corner of the world. And then as the story goes on, we get to see more and more of it. And then we realize like, oh, okay, this series is going to be about us visiting all of these exotic locales. I'm kind of excited for that. I'm sorry, my back is really hurting right now. And out of all of the locales we see on this map of the Mirabelle galaxy, three of them matter to this book. And of those three, none of them are interesting. So. Yikes. Now, I think that this is supposed to be our world in the future. I don't think it's completely fictional, fictional because they do mention the ancients coming along and first colonizing the planets and terraforming them and stuff, so I, I think that's what's going on, but they never really make it clear. And just overall, this is a very, very basic failure that... Oh, Lord. You know what? Let's, let's just get started on the book itself. This is Zenith. So we start off with a prologue. Cell 306, the past. Endless darkness. It surrounded him in Cell 306, twisting and turning itself into his bones until he and the darkness became one. So we're one sentence in, and that's, uh, that's kind of stupid. Okay, so basically, this is just a couple pages of a prologue. It's this guy named Valen Cortus, who is trapped in this cell, we don't know why he's there, but we know the conditions are terrible, and it's an okay idea for an opener. You know, it raises questions, it has a hook, we're wondering, well, how, who is he, how'd he get there? But it ends too soon. Uh, we don't really know who Valen is, what his relationship is with anything in this story. All we know is that he's a person that exists and he's in this cell, and it doesn't give us a chance to get attached or hooked into it, really, so... It doesn't do anything. So then we cut to the real beginning, which is following the main character, Androma, and that also starts off stupid. Her nightmares were like bloodstains. They were impossible to get rid of. No matter how hard Androma Rosella tried to scrub them from her mind, on the darkest nights they clung to her like a second skin. In them she could hear the whispers of the dead threatening to drag her down to hell, where she belonged. But Andy had decided, long ago, that the nightmares were her punishment. She was the bloody baroness, after all. And if surviving meant giving up sleep, then she would bear the exhaustion. Tonight, the nightmares had come as they always had, and now Andy sat on the bridge of her ship, the Marauder, scratching a fresh set of tallies into her twin swords. The glowing compression cuffs on her wrists, which protected skin burned in an accident years before, were the only light in an otherwise dark space. The press of a button was all it took to power them up. I feel like I should be listening to Linkin Park while I read this. So yeah, Androma is, like I said, a mercenary on a ship. She has lived a very dark and edgy life so far. And 
it, it's stupid to open up on a nightmare like that. Like, okay, we know it's not real. We don't really know this character, so we don't really care that much about her. And, well, it, it's kind of hard to explain in too many words, but, like, it's just clumsy. Like I was saying earlier, it's clumsy. And from this point forward, we basically just get pages of exposition. Like, the first 15 to 20 pages of the, of the book are just being introduced to, like, the Marauder and its crew and Androma. And, okay, like I said, it's clumsy, it's not very well put together, but that would be forgivable because, you know, it's the beginning of a book. We have to be introduced to stuff. But the main thing is that it says what is going on and what is happening, but it doesn't say why or how. And basically that robs it of all sorts of emotion and investment. Like, we'll go into it a little more in a minute, but, you know, it'll introduce you to characters and it'll be like, this is this person, they look like this, this is their backstory. Okay? Um, how, why am I supposed to care, though? You know, it, it sucks away any sort of happiness or investment or sadness or anger or anything that we might feel. So first up, we have the ship. The ship is called the Marauder, and it's made of this material which looks like glass, so the ship is see-through. You can actually see in and out of it, which I think is a cool visual, and it would also be cool to be on the inside of that, because then you could look out and see the stars and shit while you're flying. Uh, other than that, we get no description of what the ship is like. We don't know uh, what how big it is, we don't know what shape it is, we don't know how many rooms there are, we don't know what kind of rooms there are, uh, we don't get a real description of what it looks like from the outside, we don't get a real description of what it looks like on the inside. Everything is just up to your imagination. <laughs> you know, there's a, there's a fine line between giving the audience enough information that they can form a proper picture in their head and giving them too much information and not allowing them to use any of their imagination at all, and this one is definitely not giving enough information. And then we get introduced to the crew, who are all women. I don't know if there's a real reason for them all being women. In fact, there, I don't think there is one at all. It's just the authors felt like doing that, which... I mean, I guess this isn't a problem per se, but like, if you're gonna have a crew that all has something in common like that, then why not give us a real reason for it? Like, it could tell us, uh, okay, is their relationship to one another strictly professional, or are they just friends that decided to shack up and start wandering the galaxy together, which we learned that is the real reason for it, but still, if there was a reason for them all being women, then I feel like they would mention that. It's kind of like, I, I don't know, a better example of this sort of thing would be in an anime called uh, Gundam Iron-Blooded Orphans. There is a main character who is a man who runs a ship and all the rest of the crew are women, and why that is is because they're all his wives. He marries them because he finds them in shitty conditions, like they're poor or something, and then he marries them so that they can have a better life and they're also safe from like criminals and stuff. So, okay, that's kind of stupid, but it is at least a reason. Or something like uh, in The Expanse, Kamina Drummer's OPA faction are led by a polyamorous uh, couple, or not couple, but it's six people all in a polyamorous relationship, including Drummer herself, and like, okay, that's that's kind of interesting. It doesn't change all that much about the story, but at least it gives you an idea of like, okay, this is their relationship with one another, and we kind of lose that opportunity here. And we also learn that Androma is called the Bloody Baroness. Why is she called the Bloody Baroness? Because she kills a lot of people, I guess. I don't know. Like, there's no specific story behind it, so... I'm not sure what the point is of even having her have that nickname, just because it sounds cool, I guess. And after that, we meet the crew. We meet Lyra, who is a pilot, and she has glowing scales all over her body because the planet she's from got blasted with radiation a while ago, and it gave all the people scales. One, that's not how radiation works. Not, not even kind of a little bit. And two, that actually brings up a bigger problem with the book in that there are no aliens or anything here, but all of the humans involved have weird non-human features. Like, some of them are have horns, or they're covered in spikes, or they have weird hair or eye or skin colors, or they have scales or something like that, and, like, why? 
Like, okay, if you wanted to have people like that in here, then just make it so that they're aliens. Or just make it so that they're humans who receive some sort of genetic modifications for some reason. Like, ag again, there's people in this who, you know, have scales or have webbed hands and feet and gills or something. Uh, and part of the reason for that is that terraforming these planets was difficult on them. So, like, maybe it would make sense for them to get genetically modified so that they can have a real chance of surviving there. That would give a lot of information about the world right there and not just be weird is the thing. Like, it's not that stupid, I guess, especially compared to some other stuff in here. Like, this is soft science fiction. It's fine for it to take a few leaps in logic like that, but it's it's just weird and doesn't really fit. And uh, after that, we meet Gilly. Gilly is 13 years old and has a hot trigger finger. That is all we learn about her. And then we meet Breck, who is the head gunner on their ship. I'm not sure exactly what that job entails, other than occasionally there's a battle, okay, let's shoot stuff. Couldn't the pilot do that, or the captain or something? How many guns does this ship have? Again, we never really learn, so it doesn't tell us anything. Uh, Breck is also a seven-foot-tall woman, because the planet that she comes from also got mutated, so that they're also just really big and tall. That's their mutation. And she is an amnesiac. That's, uh, that's about all we learn. This is all given without any sort of fanfare. There's, there's no emotion or anything. Like, it genuinely feels like I was reading a Wikipedia article summary of what's going on on their ship and stuff. Like, it, it's weird. Like, the exact amount of emotion that I was giving you, that's what we get from this. And it kind of makes this book feel like it's either the second in a series or it's part of an already established universe. Like, it feels like the audience should already be familiar with all of this, so they just say, hey, here's a quick reminder, and then we can move on. Like, if this was a Star Wars book, for instance, you wouldn't need to go into that much detail about, like, okay, what's a Jedi or something like that. Because you're assuming that, okay, if the audience is picking this up, then they already know. And you're going to see that a lot throughout the rest of the book. There's a lot of stuff in here which is just not properly explained, and as such, the world never gets any real character or dimension. And after Breck, that's it. The whole crew is only four people, which is really too small, if I'm being honest. Like, there's no chance to, like, get to know these people, especially because it kind of just front loads everything there. And there's no chance to watch them really interact with one another. It's just nothing. There's, there's only those people to be, to be the crew. And that's a shame, because having a big crew full of a bunch of different people is part of what makes stuff like Firefly, Star Trek, or Mass Effect work. Like, the crew all have unique personalities, unique backstories, and useful skills, so you can understand why they, why they keep them around. You can see how they interact not just with the main character, but with each other. And you can see how they help or hinder the mission, they all can have their own arcs and stuff like that, and they all get their own moment to shine. If you don't like one of them, then okay, you can always uh, focus on another one. Like, there's a lot of uh, versatility and a lot of advantages to having a big crew, which we completely miss out on. Not to mention that, wh what exactly are the jobs people do here? Like, okay, Lyra's a pilot, that makes sense, and then they basically just have three fighters. Like, how complicated is it to really fire guns? Most of that should be done by computer, wouldn't it be? I I don't know, this setting doesn't really talk about that. So, what's Androma do? Is she the captain? Okay. She orders people around, but how difficult is that really? Does Like, do they need a captain even? I I mean, I guess they, they would, but I, I don't know. Like, they don't have an engineer, they don't have a navigator, they don't have a rogue. You know, they are criminals, it might be useful to have someone who knows how to sneak around and pick locks and stuff, but we, we don't have that. We, ha we have nothing. This crew is just four people who are not very useful to each other. So basically, the crew just goes off to find another job, because they're like, okay, we're running low on fuel, we don't have much money, let's just head off somewhere, and we'll see if we can find work. And then Androma is awoken with more nightmares. Like I said, it's a very dumb, unsubtle way of showing that she's in distress, because we know it's fake, you know, you, you can start off with like three paragraphs of italics. It's like, yes, this is a dream. And it, we all know it's going to end with something bad happens. And then she woke up in a cold sweat. It's, 
it's dumb, it's fake, it has no tension, and the fact that it's repeated so much makes it so much worse, because not only does Androma have a shitload, like an absolute shitload, of uh, these stupid nightmares, but other characters do too, and every time it happens it's really annoying and obnoxious. And anyways, they realize that they're being tailed by other ships, which they believe to be government patrols, and Androma thinks that they're from Arcadius, which is her home planet where she's wanted, and so she's like, oh shit, they're, they're finally coming after me. And then they get chased, uh, the pursuers shoot at them, they shoot back at their pursuers, etc. You know, it's just a big action scene, we can't really care about it that much because we don't really care about the characters that much, so... I mean, there's not, uh, much being given to us here, it's just words on a page. You know, like, you, you can get away with having action scenes with no real emotional connection in visual form. Like, if this was a movie or something, it might work. But here, all you have are words on a page. So you gotta do something with them, and you have to make us care. So then we get a chapter from the perspective of someone named Claren in Year 12. I don't know who Claren is. I don't know what's going on in this chapter. It's very short, and it's all in italics, so I think it's, like, either a flashback or some sort of dreamscape world or something. I... I don't know. I don't know who. I don't know what. I don't know why. I don't know how. Let's move on. So then we go to the perspective of a fellow named Dex, who is in the, one of the ships that's chasing the Marauder. And we learn that apparently he is some sort of bounty hunter, and that he's been chasing down Androma for months, and... Well, that's... that's about it. He's like, haha, I will get you. Androma, you shall be mine soon. And I guess that's a fine intro to a character, but then he immediately threatens his pilot and he comes across as kind of a douchebag. Move, he commanded. Sir, I am under direct orders from General Cortas to... Dex squeezed his fists. The pilot flinched back as four crimson triangular blades sprung out of each of Dex's gloves, just over his knuckles. Move over. The pilot stumbled as he leaped, leaped from his chair. So, long story short, the Marauder flies into a trap, and it gets boarded by Dex and the other people that are coming af after them. Uh, the crew says, like, okay, we're gonna fight, they're not gonna take us alive, and they get their weapons, and apparently Androma uses swords. And I'm just thinking, why? Why would you use swords in a futuristic setting like this? Like, guns are, guns are better in pretty much every way. That's why we use them nowadays rather than swords. Like... It's mentioned at a few points that Androma can kind of, like, dodge or deflect bullets. Um, how? Like, she has no genetic modifications or cybernetic enhancements or psychic powers or anything that's mentioned that would allow her to do that. Like, again, in Star Wars, they, they use swords. Yes, the Jedi use lightsabers, but the universe is set up in a way that will allow them to use those. Like... Okay, they have this psychic connection to the Force, which allows them to deflect blaster bolts back at people or just dodge them. Okay, it makes sense. It's a, it's a better weapon that way. But this does not have that justification. So throughout this, we learn that Dex and Androma used to be romantically involved together. They used to be an item. Okay. And then uh, they... Dex comes face to face with Androma, and she's angry, and she keeps fighting people, and it's, it's a weird scene. It's written in a weird way. With a crackle of her swords, she lunged forward and cut off three heads in one scissoring slice. The body sagged, then landed in a heap at Andy's feet. If you could cut off three of their heads with one stroke, how, how close together were they standing? This is also where we learn that Androma's cuffs, like the ones she wears on her wrists, are there to hold her burned skin together. N no? That's not how that works? Like, your skin will usually heal even if it's burned really badly? And like, sure, you might need grafts or something, but if you can get that... Your, your skin is not going to fall apart if it was burned years ago... What? It's, it's just a weird thing to say. It's like, they're trying to give Androma personality quirks by doing stuff like that, and it just doesn't make any sense. So long story short, Androma and her crew are beaten, and then they're captured alive. And then Dex and the other people that caught them bring in 
a screen so that they can talk to General Cortus, who is the leader of Arcadius, which, remember, was Ar uh, Androma's home planet. And this is also where we get Androma's backstory, or at least part of it. So it turns out that Androma was a specter for Kaylee, who is Cortus's daughter, and then she somehow killed Kaylee in some sort of spaceship crash. What is a specter? I... I don't know, it's uh, some kind of soldier or bodyguard person, like I guess they're super badass or something. Like, The thing is, the book never tells us what a specter is, which can be fine if you just allow people to figure it out through context, but then it doesn't provide us with the context we need to figure it out either, so you just go through the whole book kind of trying to guess what a specter is. Like, this book will give you in-your-face exposition at all the wrong times, and then it will give you nothing at all the wrong times. Now, that aside, I think this is an okay backstory for Androma to have. Like, she clearly feels guilt over killing someone by accident, and she did escape a death sentence. You know, that's why she's a fugitive. So, yeah, I think it's a decent idea, because the main character fleeing stuff is pretty common in just all sorts of genres, all sorts of books. Uh, but f the main character fleeing real crimes that they actually committed and they have no real justification for, yeah, that's that, that's rare, and I think that's a neat idea. The problem is that, like a lot of things in this book, it's brought up too much. Like, they keep mentioning it every couple of pages, and they keep showing flashbacks, and they keep talking about, oh, I feel so bad about it, and it just feels stupid after a while. Like, the emotion wears off. Like, if you really wanted us to feel how guilty she is, then why not show us that? Like, for example, the job she's being hired to do is to rescue uh, Kaylee's brother, who's been captured, and so maybe she could be motivated not just by uh, wanting to get her old life back and wanting to go home, but by feeling really bad that she killed this dude's sister and trying to make up for it in a way. Like, that would be interesting, but the book never does anything with that. So like I said, Cortas offers them a job. His son, Valen, uh, was apparently kidnapped two years earlier, and there was no ransom or demands or anything sent to him, so they had no idea what happened. But they think he was taken by the government of this planet called Zenpatera, or at least I think that's how you say it. It might be Zenterra. It, it, I'm not sure. The, is the P silent? I don't know. I don't really care. Uh, but anyways, basically they need a third party to go rescue them, because they think that, okay, if we send in Arcadian soldiers, then it's going to provoke a war, which nobody really wants. So Androma agrees to this in exchange for a pardon, and then we get another chapter from the perspective of Claren, and she brings up a lot of, I don't know, buzzwords, which are probably important, but I don't know what they mean, like yielded and conduits. I, like, again... It doesn't explain what it is, does not give us the context to figure it out. By the end of the book, I still had no idea what was going on in pretty much any of the Claren chapters, so I just don't give a fuck. So Dex gets sent with Androma to, so that he can be made a guardian again, because he also apparently did something bad and, as punishment, was stripped of his titles, and he doesn't really want to go with her, but Cortas kind of forces him to. Now, what is a guardian? I don't know, Like just like with Spectres. <laughs> It doesn't tell us, the context is never given. You might be noticing a pattern here. And uh, they take off with a robotic AI named Alfie. Like, it's it's an AI inside of a humanoid body, which... Uh, okay, that's fine. I'm not even sure why I bring this up, because Alfie is not important to the story, and he's not that interesting of a character on his own, either. So then we cut to a chapter from the perspective of Nor. And actually, I want to take a brief moment to clarify that... This book is written in third person, like, it's third person limited, but, I mean, that's a hell of a lot better than first person, because normally with these shitty young adults or young adult-esque novels that have a bunch of characters that all see important stuff, it's just first person from all of them, and it's very difficult to tell them apart, and it's just really shitty, so I'm... That's one area where this book did not fail. It's not something good that it did, necessarily, it's just an area where it didn't fail. But anyways, uh, it cuts to a character named Nor, and Nor is the queen of Zenpatera. And we get a whole chapter talking about how Zenpatera's resources dried up, you know, many decades ago, and 
their their people started to become impoverished and they started starving and then there that somehow led to a giant war called the cataclysm where they fought with the unified systems and it destroyed pretty much the rest of the planet now i don't really know what the unified system is systems are but we'll uh we'll get into that later and nor basically just wants uh, not only to help her people but she wants to get revenge on the unified systems because she feels like okay they're the ones that uh, destroyed all this. They're the ones that killed my parents. She's she's angry with them. So she has a double motivation. And honestly, this is a decent chapter. Now, it's basically just pure exposition, much like other chapters that have been going on. But one, the exposition that we're learning is actually cool. We're, we're learning neat stuff, which actually gives some sort of context to this world. And it gives some character to it. And we understand why things are the way they are, which is neat. Uh, it, we're introduced to an actual cool character, because I do like the character of Nora. Like I said, she has decent vil uh, villain motivations. It's not really a spoiler. This whole thing is full of spoilers. You should know that by this point. But it's uh, a decent motivation for a villain. And, okay, I kind of liked that. And, most importantly, it has actual emotion behind it. Like, we feel... Uh, the poverty that these people are stuck in. We feel their indignation. We feel uh, Nor's anger. And so, yes, this actually works as uh, as exposition because there's other, other stuff there. And the other Nor chapters are kind of similar. Like, they never overuse her, really. It's just occasionally we'll cut in, we'll have a chapter from her perspective, and most of them follow that same path. So it works. So Androma and Dex and her crew go to their job, they're kind of nervous, etc. And, um, well, there is one thing I want to bring up because it it's just kind of odd and it makes me question how weapons work in this world. Whatever you say, Androma, Breck said. If you don't mind, I'm going to take little Gilly here down to check out the new weapons. With the supplies the General gave us, we can make sparks large enough to destroy an entire moon. Now, is that meant to be taken literally? Like, I think it is. And usually, in situations like this, it's best to assume that, yeah, yeah, just take them at their word. Don't assume that the characters are lying and you have to read between the lines. If if normal people can just, in, in a small ship, keep in mind, can just get access to weapons that can destroy an entire moon, everyone is flying around with their own little Death Stars, essentially. Wouldn't that completely change the landscape? of this world? Like, wouldn't every government be focused on keeping those weapons out of other people's hands and trying to make sure that they have the most powerful ones, kind of like nuclear weapons? You know, use them as a deterrent more than anything? I... that that sounds kind of neat, but again, the book is unclear and it never does anything with it. So we also learn a little bit more about how Androma and Dex know each other. Basically, like I said, they were an item at some point, and she stabbed him, nearly killed him, and then stole his ship. Like, the Marauder was originally his, and she took it from him. And just despite this, they're still horny over each other. Like, they still keep looking at each other thinking, Wow, they're so beautiful, I miss being with them. And that's, uh... Okay? That, that may have been dramatic if we didn't see things from both of their perspectives, because... If we just saw things from Androma's perspective, and she's looking at Dex and thinking, man, I still kind of feel attached to him, I wonder how he feels about me, I hope he's no longer angry, I hope he can forgive me, that sort of thing, then maybe that there could be some drama there. But we also see things from Dex's perspective, so we, we, we know that they have already forgiven each other, and so this whole thing just kind of feels like it goes in circles. Like, Neither of them wants to confront the other about it, and then a little bit later on you'll see they actually kind of do confront each other about it, and it still goes nowhere. Like, Jesus, guys. We also get a brief flashback from Dex, and we learn a little bit more about him. Basically, he worked for years to become a guardian. Again, no idea what that is. It, they somehow work for Arcadius's government, uh, and he joins the Bounty Hunter branch of the Guardians. Again, if you work for the government, that's literally not what a bounty hunter is. Like, a bounty hunter, by definition, is someone who does not work for the government, who only goes after 
fugitives because the government offers some sort of reward for it. Like, that's... That's literally what that means. Just come up with a new term or something if you're going to do that. Call them, like, the fugitive catchers, or uh, the police force, or the patrolmen, or something like that. Like, you could do that, and it would actually make some sort of sense in that case. And we also learned that Dex basically met Androma after she had fled Arcadius, and she was basically a starving wretch on the streets, and it was only four years earlier, so... Uh, she would have been like 17 at the time, and now they're about 21 to 22 years old. And basically he just found her, and he's like, Okay, we can be friends, I can teach you stuff. And that's pretty much all the information we get. So they're flying, and they wind up explaining their plan, which is essentially that they are going to land somewhere, meet Dex's informant at a pub, and then we'll learn where things go from there. Like, they're, they're near the prison where they think Valen is being held. And then we get a brief Valen chapter, where Valen is, you know, being tortured and stuff. Oh, it's so terrible. And then he meets Queen Nor. And at this point, I started to wonder, like, why did they kidnap him? You know, the, obviously, they didn't want to ransom or anything. And they didn't even announce that they did it, so... Uh, they aren't getting much use out of it, so what are they doing? And the thing is, it's fine for the audience to be questioning that. Like, if the audience doesn't know things, then that can, you know, get them hooked in, and it can make us want to read what happens next. Like, oh, I just have to stay up another couple of minutes and read this next chapter. But the thing is, none of the characters ever ask either. Like, not once do they go, hey, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be kind of weird to kidnap a head of state's child if they're not going to do anything with that? What, maybe they're planning something else. Like, not a single character just stops and wonders things like that. Which is, uh, just w one of the many, many oversights in this. Like, that that's probably the single word I can use to describe all of this that is the most powerful. It's just, it's full of oversights. And, uh, speaking of which, uh, when they leave the Marauder to go off to the pub to meet Dex's contact, they actually lock away Alfie, remember the, the artificial intelligence, they lock him away on a part of their ship so that he can't do anything to the ship, and he can't communicate with Dex. And it's kind of set up like they're going to betray Dex at some point. Or that and a couple of uh, conversations they have, very brief conversations they have, where they're like, oh, maybe maybe he's going to betray us, we should do something to betray him first. And it's kind of set up like, okay, there's going to be some sort of conflict involving this later. Like, maybe they'll betray him, and he'll be upset, or... Maybe they'll try to betray him and it won't work and that'll get them in trouble. Or maybe they'll be on the verge of doing it, but then Androma just decides, you know what, I can't do it. Or something like that, but they just kind of forget about it. Like, they set it up and then, again, never do anything with it. Basically, the only reason that Androma doesn't betray him and Dex doesn't do anything with her is because true love, I guess. Like... Or Twoo Wove, as I like to call it, because it's stupid and doesn't add anything, and we're not given any real reason to care about it. So they go into the bar. The bar is super dingy and full of criminal scum and stuff, and there's some dumb lines to describe it. War was a heartless thing, claiming lives left and right, but it was the survivors who had to continue battling even after the fight was over. Okay. So they meet their contact, a woman named Soyina, and Soyina is an odd character. She's, she's not in the book all that much. She is overall a minor character. Basically, she used to be romantically involved with Dex, and her main character uh, personality trait is that she is horny. Like, she, she agrees to help them while doing this mostly just because she wants to have sex with Dex again. I took your advice. From now on, I'm horny. And I mean, I'm not saying you can't make a character who's like that, but it, it feels a little out of place. Like, it feels a little silly compared to uh, the tone of the rest of the book and the other characters. And we never get uh, that to spend that much time with her to really find out why she's like this and to justify that character trait, which would probably make it more interesting at least. And also, she can kind of raise the dead, 
somehow. Like, she's essentially a necromancer. It's never really explained uh, how it works. Uh, it's just that, like, if someone dies and she gets to them within three minutes, she can revive them good as new. Okay, little weird. And then, again, they use some dumb words to describe her. Soyina had a passion for darkness, and Androma Rosella's soul was the darkest of them all. And basically, what this made me realize is that Dex and Androma both have way too much backstory. Like, again, they're only 21 to 22 years old, but they have all of the life experience of a 35-year-old. Like, it's, it's weird, because they're both ha have been trained to be these crazy badass soldiers, they both have lost those titles, they've both gone off and done other careers and stuff for years and years, long enough to have like an actual reputation, and then they're trying to get it back, and they've also had a bunch of relationships with people, it's... it's odd. Like, if someone was, you know, in their 30s and they had that, it would be fine, but it feels weird to have young people that have done that much. Like, if you're going to make a young adult novel or new adult novel, I'm not, I don't really care how this would be classified, but if you're going to make a novel with young main characters, make them young main characters. Don't make them old main characters in the bodies of young main characters. It's, it's just dumb. Like, it reminds me of when I read uh, The Red Knight a while ago, and the main character was already uh, known far and wide as a really notable mercenary captain, but he was only 20 years old, and like, okay, even if he's supposed to be really young for his position, that just feels weird. Like, if he was 26 or 27, it would work, but as it stands, it's, uh, oh, it, it just, it's weird. I wish I could find better words to describe a lot of this stuff. It's just weird and dumb and I don't see the point to a lot of it. So basically, we learn about the plan at this point. The plan is to get Dex and Androma arrested, and they'll be thrown into prison with Valen, and then Soyina, who works at the prison, will help them to escape, and they will grab Valen, and then they will go out to the uh, body disposal place, like uh, the garbage shoot, I guess, and what they do is they throw all the dead prisoners in there, and then they just open it up and let them get sucked out into space. Quick question, um, if Zenpatera is running very low on resources, including water and minerals and stuff that they need to uh, fertilize their fields and grow food, why would they be dumping bodies into space? Like, they, they need resources is the thing. Like, normally when a person dies, their body rots, which is them being eaten by like insects and bacteria and plants and stuff, and then they use the the nutrients and resources and stuff to propagate their own species and then something else eats them and then something else eats them. It's it's the circle of life. That's how that works. But if you throw them out into space, you're wasting all of that. It's 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 weird. In fact in fact in the real world there are people who kinda don't want to be buried in a casket the traditional way because it's a, a waste of all those resources. You know, you're being put underground and then the worms and everything can't get to you and so the plants and animals are going to start to die. I actually had a friend who <laughs> died a little over a year ago, and he didn't want to be buried like that. He actually literally told us, just prop me up against a tree and let a bear eat me, which, unfortunately, we couldn't do. That's illegal, so his wife had him cremated. But, you know, the, the point is, people need those resources, and your planet is desperate for it, so why not just grind them up and make them into fertilizer? So, Androma and Dex kiss... And then we cut away from that, even though it was getting kind of interesting, to a chapter with Nor. In fact, that actually happens a lot in this book. They'll be in the middle of a tense situation, and then it cuts to someone else for a chapter or two. And basically, Nor also has a nightmare, and she is also uh, having sex with her bodyguard. And that's about all we learn here. And it wouldn't bother me that much, but I do wish that we gotten more with that, like, maybe her bodyguard was, like, the one person that she could uh, it, get close to, and they do mention that, but then we never really see him again after this chapter, so... Uh, okay. So basically, Androma and Dex start a bar fight to try and get themselves arrested. 
Glass rained down on top of them. Lyra opened her eyes to see Breck hunched over beside her, coughing smoke from her lungs, eyes watering, and red. Mountains crumble, Lyra thought. How strong had Gilly's homemade sparks been? Perhaps they'd been a bit too generous with the amount of powder they poured into the orbed casings. Lyra rolled to her hands and knees and crawled past the scattered playing cards, bottles of broken liquid, and moaning bodies on the floor. Somewhere across the room, the bartender howled out curses over the wasted liquor. My leg! Someone screamed. My leg! So, Andromeda and Dex get arrested, and they get taken away and thrown into Lunamir, which is, like, supposed to be the worst prison in the galaxy. Like, you're, you're there, you sit in a dark, damp cell all day, you get tortured, you're barely fed, and then you die. And that seems, like, really harsh for people who basically just assaulted others, yes, and they did break stuff. I'm not saying they shouldn't be punished for that. But I am saying that Lunamir really feels like somewhere you'd put serial killers and political opponents. Like, what, what is even... G why? <laughs> it seems weird for them to do that. Like, I feel like they get tossed in the drunk tank or something, but... Okay, whatever. And we get another fucking flashback from Androma. Turns out she was friends with Kaylee, remember General Cordis's daughter, uh, and Kaylee actually encouraged her to go on a joyride with her, essentially, in the spaceship, and they flew around for a while, and Kate, uh, Androma was piloting, and then she crashed, and Kaylee died. And the thing is, that's all you need to know about it, and this first flashback gives you all of that, but it keeps coming back to it. Like, we, we get this same flashback, not even really from different perspectives, but in slightly different ways, so many times, like six or seven times throughout the entire book, and... I kept thinking that, okay, near the end of the book, they're going to reveal some new piece of information that will change the way we look at it. Like, maybe Kaylee was actually committing suicide, and she crashed the ship on purpose, and Androma tried to save her and couldn't. Like, okay, that would be kind of interesting, but no, there, there are new, there's no new information, no new revelations, just everything I told you is everything the book gives us. And then we get Valen having a brief flashback to right after his sister died, and it gets odd. Valen took equal amounts of pain and comfort in this as he walked. They could throw Androma into the pits of Tenebris for as long as they liked, even give her a death sentence, but it wouldn't bring Kaylee back. When he passed by his sister's room, he caught the slightest hint of her summertime scent. It lingered like a distant breeze, quickly swept away when reality took its place. Why do you know what your sister smells like? And we get some Claren chapters, and rather than just keeping to keep going back and forth between Claren and everything else, I'm just going to give you most of the Claren stuff right now. So basically, it turns out Claren is Nor's mom. She used to be the queen of Zen Patera. And during the Cataclysm, which remember was a giant war between Zen Patera and the Unified Systems, uh, she was captured by Cordus's soldiers. Like, their soldiers somehow broke onto the planet itself and went to the palace where the royals were, and then they kidnapped her, but they missed the others, and apparently the war went on for, like, years afterwards? Uh, which is weird, like, if the battle was already in the capital, which was, like, the most important place to protect, then presumably they had already- okay. Whatever, whatever. And basically, Claren spends years as Cordis's prisoner, and they start- having sex, and yes, that is extremely rapey. But it's not rapey in the way that you're thinking. We're gonna circle back to that later, I just want you to keep that in mind. It's... it, it stays rapey. I'm not saying anything here is justified because it's not, but like, just... we'll get to it. And then we get more flashbacks! Again from Valen, he has apparently no guards, and that's how he was able to be kidnapped, because why would the son of a head of state need guards? Like, it, it just doesn't really make sense. And like, sure, sure, I get that's... Just fine, whatever, fuck it. I'm not complaining about that anymore. So Soyina unlocks the cells for Valen and Androma, and they manage to escape, and they start killing guards, and it's phrased as Androma dealing out death like a deck of cards. Just, what? There, there's so many, like, weird moments like that which just completely took me out of it and made me remember, oh yeah, I'm reading a book. 
and it's not a particularly good one. Uh, and they manage to grab Valen, and they're trying to drag him away, but he's too weak, so instead she knocks him out and continues dragging him away, which is weird, because, like, even if he's having trouble standing or having trouble walking, he can... trying to carry him between the two of you would be easier if he was able to help a little bit? Like, have you guys ever tried to actually carry an unconscious person? It's total dead weight. It's... it's hard. You know, it's very exhausting, if you can even do it at all. You have to be fairly strong to pick up someone who is your weight or heavier. So they escape, and I'll admit that the action scene that goes through all that is not the worst thing ever. Like, I don't have too much to complain about there. And they get Valen to the ship. He's still unconscious, and he's still unhealthy. They mention there's something abnormal in his blood. They don't know what it is. Okay, I mean... Admittedly, they could do a more subtle job of foreshadowing that something wrong is gonna happen, but at least they are, in fact, setting it up before it happens. Like, you know, this is something being set up which does pay off later, which is more than I can say for most of the things that happen in this book. So, while they are traveling back to Arcadius, uh, Dex and Androma finally confront each other about their feelings and about what went on between them before, and basically it turns out that Dex only betrayed Androma and uh, tried to turn her into the Arcadian authorities because his dad was in prison on Arcadius. And General Cordus told him, hey, I'll let your dad go if you can get her. If not, I'll kill your dad. Now, I don't like this for a couple of reasons. One, it kind of sanitizes his actions all at once, so we don't really have an arc where he realizes, oh, I did something wrong and Androma has to learn to forgive him, or something like that, which would be a lot more interesting. But even setting that aside, it kind of forgets that Androma also did terrible things to him. Like, she literally tried to murder him, and then she stole his ship, which apparently he doesn't even want his ship back. Like, he... He never says or does anything to suggest, like, hey, the Marauder's mine, can I have it back? Like, no. The book treats it like, okay, Androma needs to forgive him because he was trying to save his father. And, like, sure, that is morally ambiguous, like, you are betraying a friend in order to save your father, but, like, it's understandable. And her, it, it's weird because it's only saying that she needs to forgive him. It's not mentioning that she also did terrible things and he needs to forgive her. And, like, I don't like accusing characters of being Mary Sue's because 90% of the time when people do that, it's not accurate, and I don't like using it because it just puts the idea in more people's heads and then they start using it inappropriately, but... Yeah, that is something that would make a character a Mary Sue if other people harming them is seen as the worst thing in the universe. Like, how could you ever possibly do this? But them harming other people is just, tee well, I'm just not like other girls. So we go back to Nor. We turn, it turns out she made a mind control substance of some sort. Uh, they don't actually give it a name, I don't believe. And the rules for it are never clear. It's just, okay, someone touches it, it absorbs into their skin and into their bloodstream, and then they will immediately do whatever Nor says. Um... All right, like, it, the thing is, there has to be some sort of rules for it, otherwise there's no tension. Like, if the rules are just that it wears off after a while and it needs to be reapplied, then, okay, that would be one thing, because doing it like this makes her too powerful as a villain, and, and her uh, technology, if you want to call it that, is just too powerful as a villain, so we know that the main characters are going to come along and stop it somehow, but they're probably going to have to do it through some artificial deus ex machina, so ironically, making your villain too powerful can make them less intimidating. And then, there's more dumb lines. She turned to Darai and Zan with a grin as solid as steel. My soldiers, it's time to darken the stars. She actually does that a lot. She talks about, like, feasting on the bones of the galaxy and stuff. It's like, the authors seem to think that by making lines more melodramatic, they make them better. It's... it's not better. The idea is to make your audience feel like you're there. Also, I'd like to point out that despite all of this, we're like a third of the way through the book. So, something goes wrong with the Marauder, some techno babble, it's not important. The engine is bad, and so they can't fly anymore, and they crash on a planet called Adhira, which is Lyra's home planet. Remember, Lyra, the pilot with the scales on her. 
And as soon as they crash, uh, no one is hurt or anything. The ship is damaged, but, you know, you can repair that. And as soon as they crash, Lyra's brother, named Lon, greets them. And her and Lon go off together for a little while, and long story short, it turns out that their aunt is the queen of Adira. And TLDR, Lyra was supposed to become queen after this, but she fled responsibility. Um, okay? Like, I really hate this trope. This trope of, like, a prince or princess fleeing their responsibilities because, oh, I just want to be wild and free. Like, for starters, it's just annoying that someone who was presumably raised in a environment where they got kind of everything they needed and never really struggled that much is acting so spoiled like this. That's just annoying. But also, like, you don't actually have to take on the responsibility if you don't want to. Like, all you have to do is find some unscrupulous politician and say, yo, dude, you want to be my prime minister? You can have all the real power while I'm just your puppet and I'm going to go off and drink and party and stuff all the time. What say you? And, like, it wouldn't be that hard to find someone like that. Like, it, it, it's weird that they always choose to run off. Like, they never even decide, okay, you know what, I'm going to do this, but I'm going to do it my own way and maybe have a different ruling style or something. And then during the conversation with the queen, the queen mentions that Cortas is a good leader, but his honesty and his methods are questionable at best. And that just throws me off, because for, for a couple of reasons. One, this book so far has treated him as though he's a nasty dictator who will, like, kill political opponents and execute people if it helps get him what he wants, which is, you know, really not something that you think of in a good leader. But also, he is a ruling person called a general. Usually when a general is in charge of a country of any sort, that means the country is run by some sort of military junta. Like, it came to power through a coup or through a revolution of some sort, and it keeps its power just through pure force of arms. Like, it's not even interested in pretending to be a real government. It's just like, yeah, we have the guns, give us shit. And... The thing is, it never. this book never goes into any sort of detail about how the general came to power. Like, it's mentioned that his daughter Kaylee was supposed to be his successor after he died. Obviously, she isn't anymore because she's dead. But that would imply that this is more of a monarchy than a military government. And, okay, if it's a monarchy, then why is he called general? And is he a nasty dictator or not? Like, the book is kind of giving us different things there which don't match up at all and honestly like if he is just essentially a king if they essentially have a hereditary monarchy but their leader's title is just general then okay why not take a moment to explain the origin of that title like world building guys just a little bit of world building goes a long way like giving us a little bit of the history of arcadius would tell us not only about general cortis as a character but also about this Mirabel galaxy as a whole and what Arcadius's place is in the galaxy and the sort of environment Androma was raised in and how she may have wound up this way like there's a lot you can do just by giving us a little bit of information and this book cannot do that so basically while their ship is being repaired on Adira they spend they just fuck around on the planet basically and we spend around one quarter of the book here which not a lot of important stuff happens, so I can just give you the uh, the Cliff Notes version. Basically, Lyra refuses to be queen. Like, uh, her aunt asks her, hey, do you want to be queen? She's like, no. And it's not even like she has to think on it for a minute or anything. It's nothing like that. Uh, we learn that Zen Patera used to be part of the Unified Systems. Again, uh, I'm not sure what the Unified Systems are. I believe there's some sort of military alliance rather than an actual government because you know, uh, Arcadius and Adira and Zempatera and stuff all have, you know, their own thing going on and there's never any reference to, like, a higher government, like a president or a parliament or anything like that. So I'm pretty sure it's just a military alliance, but again, the book never really brings that up. Uh, which also means that the Cataclysm was a civil war, which I guess that doesn't make that much of a difference, but it still would have been nice to know before this. And... Apparently, Zen Patera was thought of as a weak planet uh, because the Queen mentions that it's always been a weak planet and now it's even weaker, which is weird because 
they fought off the entire galaxy by themselves for over a decade, and apparently a shitload of stuff got destroyed, not just on their planet, but on other stuff. So that doesn't sound like a weak planet to me. Maybe you should stay consistent with the things you say. We get our first mention of the Ancients who came to colonize these planets and terraform them. And again, that's why I think that this is just humans from Earth many years in the future, uh, rather than a completely original world. And then there's apparently also some sort of generic dance festival, which everyone has to attend because every shitty young adult novel and a lot of good young adult novels have shitty dance festivals that the characters have to attend. And while they're at that festival, Dex is staring longingly, longingly at Androma, thinking about how much he wants to dance with her. And I, I just have to read these dumb lines because they're fun. She could have been the woman of his dreams, but today, Dex didn't care. In truth, all he cared about was catching a glimpse of Andy in the crowd. Andy, with her stab you in the balls and laugh as you scream eyes. And also, while this is going on, uh, Valen and Androma talk about what's been going on, like, hey, she accidentally killed his sister, and it's been years since they really saw each other, and he, long story short, he does forgive her. You know, he does talk about how, hey, you know what, I've had a lot of time to think while I was in that prison cell, and honestly, like, I don't, it's not that I don't care anymore, it's that this wasn't your fault, and just being angry isn't going to help anything. And honestly, I kind of like this scene, other than the fact that it ends with the darkness seemed a little brighter now, as if it wasn't entirely black after all. This isn't your average everyday darkness. This is advanced darkness. But, you know, joking aside, that is a decent scene. I, I kind of liked it. it. It was a bit heartwarming. It was Valen coming to terms with some shit that had happened in his past, and it was clearly a load off for Androma as well. But the problem is that Dex sees them while they're together like this, and he thinks that they're suddenly an item, and they're going to be smooching on each other, and it makes him sad. So while they're at the generic dance festival, the people of Zen Patera attack. You know, there's just a bunch of soldiers who come out of nowhere and start shooting people, and everyone's like, oh no, let's run away. And then Androma and Dex and the crew, along with Valen, uh, have to battle their way out of the dance festival, generic dance festival. I genuinely, it, it doesn't even matter what it's called. It, it doesn't matter what it's called. They're all the fucking same. It's just a dance where people put on pretty, pretty dresses, and it's not the only one in this fucking book either, so we're just moving past it. But th basically, they battle their way to a ship hangar, which honestly is not a terrible battle scene. Like, I was kind of into it for a little bit. It's not amazing, but I, I liked it. It's not the worst thing in this book. And they escape on a new ship, which is not the Marauder, uh, which actually doesn't matter that much, but... Anyways, they head to Arcadius, and I don't know how long this takes. Like, knowing how long it takes to go from place to place is kind of important in spacefaring sci-fi. Like, if it takes months to even get across the solar system, then that says one thing. It says, like, okay, it, the, these are clearly very different places, very disconnected from one another. It would be difficult for anyone to have any sort of centralized government, yada yada. But if it takes, like, two days to go from one end of the galaxy to the other, then you realize, okay, this is actually a pretty small world, despite the fact that, you know, it's a massive galaxy. It's, it's actually seems small, and we, we never learn any of that. Like, you know, not a single reference is made. And in fact, we don't even know how long this uh, book takes place over the course of. Like, it could be, like, a week, for all I know, and... That's actually kind of important to the characters as well, because if Androma and Dex are getting this attached to one another again after being apart for so long, and it's after like a week, then that's stupid. If it's over the course of like three months, then well, that, that makes a little more sense. Because again, they, they were already a thing in the past, and this is just them reconnecting rather than connecting in the first place. But we never get any idea of what it's like, so we don't know what's going on. So they finally make it to Arcadius, and we learn that the main continent on the planet is called Airy? Airy? I'm, I'm not sure exactly how to say that, which is 
weird because it, it made me realize that all of the names in this book, not just the planets, but also people and stuff, don't really follow any sort of pattern. So, like, y you know, like in England, for example, most of the names follow some sort of pattern. You can tell, like, okay, that's that's English. Or in Spain, you know, the names are all usually Spanish names, or at least a Spanish version of names from other languages. Whereas with this, it just sort of throws in a bunch of names. Like, some of them are kind of normal, like Arcadius, some of them are a little weird, and some of them are really weird, like Airy or Zenpatera. And it makes this, the culture of this world, if you want to call it that, feel more like a muddled mess than any sort of cohesive uh, thing that would have an actual identity, which, again, having an identity in your world is important, and this book doesn't do that. And uh, it's also referred to as a military planet, like Arcadius is just the military planet, which again raises the question, how is the general in charge? Did he overthrow a previous government or something? Like, get, just one or two sentences is really all we would need. But there's so many points in this book where one or two sentences would give it so much leeway with me. But there's none. It doesn't even feel like they didn't try. It kind of feels like that at a few points, but it doesn't feel like that for the most part. It feels like they had no idea what they were doing. So they finally meet back up with General Cortus, and he basically says, you know, Zen Patera kidnapped my son. That's an act of war, kind of. And so I'm going to have to invite the other leaders in the unified systems here so that we can figure out what to do about Zen Patera. And Andromeda's like, wait, no, that's not a good idea. And he's like, I'm going to do it anyways. I don't care that's dangerous, which... <sighs> Just get a big fucking neon sign that says foreshadowing, foreshadowing. And he also decides he's going to keep Andromeda around. I'm really not sure why. Because he specifically says he's going to make her a bodyguard for Valen. Why? Like, he already... General Cordus very clearly hates Andromeda because... You know, even if it was an accident, she did kill his daughter. She, now he's assigning her as a bodyguard for his son, his only living child now. And, like, is he trying to fuck with her? And, like, he also refuses to give her back her ship or uh, scrub her record clean or anything like that if she doesn't do it. So, I don't, I just, why? Like, is he just fucking with her? Because I don't think he is. It's, it certainly never feels like he's just fucking with her. Uh, is is he gonna kill her anyways? And if he was, why wouldn't he just do it now? It just, it's so odd. It doesn't fit with the character that has been set up so far, such as it is, because we don't actually know that much about the general, but it, it doesn't fit, and it feels off. Like, again, this was written by two separate people, so maybe one of them wanted the general to be more reasonable and one of them wanted to, him to be just a crazy dictator, and they just kind of, rather than compromising in some way, some of the time he's crazy, some of the time he's reasonable, which doesn't really feel right. So then Andromeda's father enters the story very briefly. Um, he's never been mentioned before this point, and apparently he is General Cordes' head specter. Again, I'm pretty sure that means he's a bodyguard, but hard to tell. And he, he, her dad is the one that helped her escape, you know, when she was in prison years, excuse me, years earlier. He's the one that gave her a key and allowed her to run off. And they've had no contact since, which, you know, makes sense because she's a fugitive. And if he contacted her and didn't tell the general about it, then he would probably be executed. Uh, and Androma is angry about this because she's like, you should have come with me, dad. You, you should have also been eating out of garbage bins and given up your life, even though you already put yourself at great risk to help me out here. And maybe that's, like, expected of parents, but still, like, he did put himself at great risk, and he risked his career, his life, his wife's life, uh, to help her out, and that's not good enough for her. And so Androma comes across as a whiny little bitch right here. I know that sounds a little harsh, but that really is what she comes across as. And I was kind of on her dad's side, even though the narrative clearly didn't want me to be on her dad's side. But then he talks about how she ruined the family name, and how he worked his whole life to become an honorable member of society, and how she kind of ruined that. And the only way he could hold on to that was by not contacting her. So, like, again, the narrative 
is clearly trying to paint him as an asshole, which he is, uh, to make me sympathize more with Androma, but instead I'm just feeling like, no, you, you're, you're both terrible people. So Dex and Androma, again, start talking about how much they love each other, how much they want to smooch on each other, and no progress is made. What is it about memories, Andy said suddenly, walking back towards him, that gives them the ability to hurt us so badly? Dex shook his head. The past is powerful. I think you and I both know that. So, uh, the Queen of Adira, remember Lyra's aunt, uh, comes back, and she brings the Marauder with her. It's all fixed, and there was really no point to the characters being without it. Like, it didn't cost them anything to get it repaired, uh, and they weren't left without it for a long time. They didn't find themselves in a situation where, oh, I need the Marauder, but, like, it's gone. It was just, okay, they left in a new ship. Like, functionally, they could have just taken the Marauder and left Adira with that and come here, and it would have made no difference. And then, uh, Androma's mom shows up, and she's pretty much the same as her dad, in that her mom is kind of vapid and talking about how, oh, you ruined our name, but her mom also kind of tries to connect with her again, and Androma's just mad because, like, you didn't come with me, you should have come with me, and been a fugitive eating out of garbage cans, and always fearing for your life, which is really unreasonable to ask of anyone, I think. And basically, it's just the same thing as the dad, so there's really no point to repeating it, but it's just a little more in your face about it, because the dad at least had some subtlety, and you could conceivably take his side in that, like, the narrative clearly didn't want you to, but you could conceivably do so. But her mom is just, like, so over the top, and talking about how eating out of garbage cans is a silly thing to do, exact quote, by the way, and so Androma just screams at her, tells her to get out, and it's just repeating the same shit, and it serves no purpose. So then the second fancy generic ball in this book starts again, and it's just... it is what it is. They spend time getting ready because despite Androma being this badass mercenary space captain who's known as the Bloody Baroness and who is constantly haunted by the ghosts of people she's killed and feels enormous guilt over getting her friends killed, Despite all of that, she also likes to wear pretty dresses and put on makeup and stuff. Am I a pretty girl? I mean, I guess having multiple aspects to a character is fine, but like... Make them actually fit together. And maybe, maybe I'd be okay with that if this weren't kinda trying to be a young adult book and every other one did something similar, where you have a badass heroine who doesn't take shit from anybody and likes to fight and can beat up men all the time, but also is a girly girl sometimes. Like, if I hadn't seen that so many times, it wouldn't bother me so much, but it fucking does. So the general makes a speech to um, both his citizens and the leaders of the unified systems who showed up there, and at that exact moment, Valen's mind control kicks in, and Nor controls him, and he stabs the general. He stabs his dad, and everyone's like, Whoa, what the hell? And then Zen Patera's soldiers attack again. And this time I have to ask, how did they sneak in? Like, they got here with no warning. No one fought them, and they were able to break past or anything. They just pop up outside the ball and start killing folks. And... Okay, they kind of hand wave it away with Adira, because they're like, oh, they don't really have a military presence, and okay, I can kind of accept that, but Arcadius is literally referred to as a military planet, and it's kind of hinted at that they have the most powerful armed forces in the entire galaxy, so you'd think they would take security seriously, and if there was some sort of gap in security that allowed the soldiers to get through, I mean, that, that could be interesting, but like, what was it? Was it... Valen? Did he let them in? Possibly. It's never said. And just, this book is pretty long, okay? It's nearly 600 pages, and they spend so much time repeating the same shit over and over again, and so much time on things that don't matter. Like I, like I said, we got like this much of the book that's just on Adira, and nothing interesting happens there, and just so much time wasted. And we don't spend any time talking about stuff that's actually kind of important, like this. It's just... it's so clumsy! So while all of this chaos is going on, 
uh, Androma goes up to fight Valen, and, like, his dad is still alive, barely, and she has a knife now, and she's like, hey, Valen, don't kill him, and he's like, I'm gonna kill him, and she's like, don't do it, and he's like, I'm gonna do it, and then they have a knife fight, and it goes back and forth for a while, somehow, and then Valen wins by stabbing Androma, and how did he do that? Because not only was Valen in prison for years, and should still be uh, working his way back up to being, you know, in shape and everything, but he's never been even hinted at as a badass fighter. Like, as far as we know, he's never fought in his life. He has no idea how to do it. But Androma is a very skilled fighter, you know? Even though it doesn't make that much sense uh, in the world that they set up, she's able to fight dudes who have guns just using two swords. And we see her do that plenty of times. She mows down bad guys like... Oh, I mean, not like it's nothing, but actually, no, a lot of the time it's like it's nothing, but she can't defeat Valen. Why? Uh, seriously, why? That doesn't make any sense. I mean, maybe you could say, okay, she's, she's holding back because she doesn't actually want to hurt him, which, I mean, that could be an excuse, you know, she could, or she could get distracted or something, but the books never bring it up. There are so many little outs, like there's so many little problems like that, that you you could give yourself an out with, but these authors just completely fail to do that in every way, which makes me wonder what the editing process was like for this. So Dex sees this, he sees the general and Androma get stabbed, and amidst all the chaos with soldiers killing each other and stuff, uh, he manages to drag the general and Androma back to the Marauder. Not sure how he does that, because, again, they're both unconscious, so he would have had to, like, carry one on each shoulder. And, I mean, maybe he's strong enough to do that, but it's never mentioned that Dex is, like, a big, strong guy or anything, so... Again, like, just just a brief sentence would have fixed this, but... Okay, whatever. And everyone else that's there, including uh, the Marauder's crew, gets hit with the mind control substance that Nor had. And, like, it looks like they die but then they rise back up a, mo a few moments later, and they're like, yes, my queen, I shall do whatever you say. So then Nor arrives personally, and she's controlling all of them through her psychic powers, which apparently she has. Okay, here's the thing. You can put, like, magic or psychic powers or something into a sci-fi setting, especially if it's a soft sci-fi setting like this. You, you can get away with that. You really can. But you need to bring it up less than 500 pages in. Like, we're over 500 pages in when that gets brought up, and it feels like the opposite of a deus ex machina. Because a deus ex machina is basically when the heroes are in some sort of trouble, and the authors can't think of a way to get them out of it, so they just basically have them get lucky, and at the last second something will come in and save the day. And it's usually very unsatisfying, and the problem is, most of the time, that the authors did not set things up properly beforehand. Like, if they had properly hinted at it earlier, then that could usually work. Not always, but it can usually work. Uh, the This is, like, the opposite of that. I, I'm not sure what you would call it, but it's like the villain suddenly coming in and saying, Haha, I have a new power. Like, oh, okay? I mean, before this, we were wondering, oh, what kind of devious plan do you have to take care of all this? And, uh, I mean, obviously we knew about the mind control stuff, but we were thinking, okay, what kind of... A secret military maneuver or something are you going to use to get your planet back on track and to destroy all the people who wronged you? And I guess it's just having psychic powers, which we never knew about before, which is... I mean, again, had they hinted at it earlier, or even just come right out and said it earlier, then that could have been fun. In fact, it could have made the character of Nor seem more intimidating, but as it stands, uh, they tried a little too hard to make her seem like this overwhelming, powerful force, and ironically, that makes her less intimidating. It makes her less of a compelling villain, and it makes her less. It makes her seem less powerful, and it takes away from the tension of the story because we know, okay, at some point, the heroes are going to have to find a way to beat her. So, we we just feel like the authors are going to have to write themselves out of that corner. Well, that's kind of disappointing, because I, I kind of liked Nor up until this point. So while Dex, Androma, and the General are flying away on the Marauder, 
uh, and they're all dying, and they manage to stabilize Androma, but the general is still dying, and he basically, with his dying breath, gives them the last bit of information they need. Uh, basically, it turns out that Claren, remember Nora's mom, the former queen who he took prisoner, is also Valen's mom. But it turns out that she had psychic mind powers, just like Nor, and she actually used them to convince him that he was in love with her, and then they started having sex. So, like I said, it was rapey, just not in the way you expected. It was actually the general that was essentially getting raped there. I, uh... I, I suppose that counts as a plot twist. I'll admit I didn't see it coming. After the general realized this, he got really pissed, and he just stuffed Claren into a pod and shot her off into deep space where maybe she died? I'm not sure. Maybe the interlude chapters were her still alive, trying to communicate with people using her psychic powers. I think maybe that's what it is, but that's also weird because, like, how would she have survived that? Like, she had no food or water and very little oxygen, presumably, so... And we don't know how her powers work. Like, maybe she just left her body and her mind became one with the universe or something, which would be kind of neat if that were the case, but they... we have no idea what the rules of this universe are like, so... I don't know if th that she did that. I don't think she did. And I have no idea what's going on. And it's not, like, in a compelling way where we're asking the questions, Oh, how are they doing this? What's going to happen? It, it's in a confusing way where it's like, Oh, um, I don't understand this. What's going on? And basically, Nor used her psychic powers to find out that Valen was her brother. Because he kind of has them too. And she realized, Oh, okay, that's my brother. And she was able to use that to build her plan around. Like, that's why she kidnapped him in the first place was to indoctrinate him, I don't think there's a better word for it, but indoctrinate him into doing this, and then help her kill the general and take over everything. And she also, uh, while mind-controlling all of the other leaders of the unified system, she just kills them all. And I guess that's sad and stuff. And basically, the general, uh, he realizes he's about to die, so he officially passes on his title to Androma, so, like, she is officially the general of Arcadius now, and so she has access to, like, classified information I, and stuff, I suppose, and, like, on paper, she is the commander of the armed forces and all that. But, okay, I understand why he would have chosen her, because he really had no choice. It was, like, basically, either her or Dex, I trust her more. Okay, whatever, that's, a, that's not a big deal, but... Her having that title is meaningless without the authority. Like, if I somehow, through whatever weird legal shenanigans, found out tomorrow that I was heir to the throne of France, no one would give a shit, because they don't have a monarchy anymore. They haven't for a very long time. And I don't have an army or anything to back me up on that, so... No one would give a shit. I would just be seen as a crackpot, and like... Yeah, I'm pretty sure Nora's gonna have a similar reaction, like, okay, Androma can strut around and say she's the rightful general all she wants, like, I'm the one that has a fucking army, so it really doesn't mean anything. And just, that's, uh, that's it, that's the end. My reaction when I first read that was, um, okay then, I guess, I guess that's the end. And I think the main reason that I was so nonchalant about it was... N not even that it was, like, terrible, just nonchalant about it, was because the climax was really boring. And it was over pretty quickly. Like, like I said, the Zen Paterans just kind of came out of nowhere, fought a bunch of people, which they had already done once before, so all the tension and, and surprise and everything was gone. And then a bunch of the good guys were taken and mind-controlled, and then a couple of them got, went away, and... Androma's the general now, but like I said, that means nothing. You know, it's uh, it just sort of happens quickly, and then it's over. And the only reason that we would conceivably care that all this shit was going down was if we cared about the crew, which, I mean, we don't. Mostly because only Lyra really got any screen time here. You know, out, out of all the people that got mind-controlled... Only Lyra was someone who we actually had an idea of what she was like as a person. Like, the other two crewmates, Breck and Gilly, you might notice I barely mentioned them after the intro. That's because they're barely in the 
fucking book after the intro. So, in that regard, it just kind of fails at what it was setting out to do. Uh, and beyond that, like, why would we care about the unified systems? Like, what what have they done? Like, as far as we can tell, they seem to be a bunch of kind of unpleasant dictatorships, and it's not that Zen Patera or Nor ruling over everything would be better, it probably wouldn't be, but, I, I mean, it's not like it would be that much worse, I don't think, so it's not like we're thinking, oh, we need to protect democracy and freedom or anything like that, and we don't particularly, we don't feel attached to the fate of these countries, you know, it's not like we're uh, being inflicted with any sort of nationalism, and it's not like Androma is either, or any of the other characters, so in that regard, it didn't even feel like it tried to make us care about this, and I can't even say it was a failure, it just, like, did not put its energy in the right direction. Overall, like I said, this is a pretty bad book. Mostly, it's just clumsy. Like, it, that's not to say that, oh, it would be good if it was done better. Like, I think if it was done better, it would be okay. But mostly, that's it. Like, it tries to do things, and it fails at it because it just can't focus on anything. Like, the world has no real dimension or identity. Like I said, we have no real feeling on what the history of this world is like, or the political situation, or uh, the culture of the people who live there, or just what it's like to live in this place, or hell, weird geographic features, maybe, maybe not geographic, but uh, weird space features like quasars or black holes that are nearby. You know, just putting in stuff like that could add uh, dimension and character to this, but they don't do any of that. And so all we're left with is a couple of little scraps that the characters drop occasionally, and those aren't particularly good. Uh, the story, like I said, is super fucking repetitive and does and says basically the same things over and over again, and it goes off in different directions at various points. Like I said earlier, it was kind of hinted that, okay, the crew is going to betray Dex at some point, but then they just don't, and they never do anything with that. Or... Uh, how Androma has that one flashback where she's with Kaylee and Kaylee dies multiple times and we never learn anything new about it, or how basically every character has at least one moment where they wake up from a nightmare and it's stupid every time because we always know it's fake. It's mostly Androma, but Nor, Lyra, and Dex also all wake up from nightmares, so that's basically every POV character. Uh, like I said, Two authors wrote this, it feels like there was absolutely no coordination between them, and even if there was no coordination between them, that could maybe have worked if it had been properly edited, but I don't think it was. I was not there for it, so I can't say for certain, but it really doesn't feel like it was properly edited. The lead characters are overwritten, and by the leads I mean Dex and Androma, because, like I said, they just have way too much backstory for people who are so young. Like, both of them were trained to be these super cool elite soldiers, and they had experience being an elite soldier, and they were stripped of that title for something, and they both had to go off and be independent, uh, maybe not fugitives in Dex Dex's case, but they had to go off and do their own thing, and they had multiple uh, romantic relationships before the story starts that still affect them, and they both feel guilt about stuff that happened in their past, and they're finally trying to... Uh, redeem themselves and get their old titles back, like, that's just a lot of stuff there. In my opinion, uh, a character is overwritten when their backstory cannot be summarized pretty simply. Like, uh, for example, one of the best characters I've read in the past several years is Dalinar Colon from the Stormlight Archive, and without getting into too much detail, his backstory is basically that he was the younger brother of a warlord, he developed a reputation as being a fierce warrior, but also someone who killed a lot of people who didn't really deserve killing. Uh, and then he met someone who caused him to kind of mellow out a little, and then there was some sort of tragedy which caused him to completely break down and become an alcoholic. And then his brother, the king, was killed, and so he found out, you know what, I have to step up now and become a better person to help calm things down after this mess that I kind of helped create uh, comes back to bite everyone in the ass. Hopefully that's not too spoilery, I apologize if it is, but basically, yeah, that's a pretty simple backstory when you get down to it, uh, even if, like, once you get into the details, yeah, it's very complicated because a big chunk of Oathbringer is dedicated to that, 
but you know he's not overwritten because okay it all ties together and makes sense whereas Androma and Dex I think if you had cut out a couple of the things that happened to them or at the very least just made them older then it would have been fine but it's yeah, it it just doesn't work on any level uh, the side characters are both over and underwritten like mostly talking about Lyra in that sense because she has a similar problem where she's really young, but her backstory goes over a bunch of different things that it doesn't really need to go over. Uh, but she also doesn't have that much personality in the present. Like, I will say that Dex and Androma kind of have a little bit of personality, even if Androma is, like, bordering on being a Mary Sue. Mostly just because of, like, the way everyone treats her and how, oh, how dare you hurt the protagonist, but the protagonist can hurt you. Um, but... Other characters just don't don't have that much to them, you know, even if those two do. do. And it kind of feels like the authors keep pointing at stuff and saying, that's cool, but without giving any reason for why it's cool. Like, Androma fights with these two swords. That's cool, but like, why does she fight with those two swords? She, her nickname is the Bloody Baroness. That's cool. It kind of is, but like, why is she called the Bloody Baroness? You know, usually you have to have a specific story behind something like that. Uh, otherwise, it just feels tacked on, which is exactly what it is. The only thing in this book that I genuinely liked was Nor, uh, because I think she's a... I'm not going to say she's a solid villain, but she's a solid foundation for a villain, if nothing else. She does have a uh, pretty good motivation for doing what she's doing. She does have some personality. And while they did screw up a little bit at the end with the introduction of her powers, I think that that could work, maybe in a future sequel, which I'm not going to read, Overall, this book, I, I don't hate it. You know, it's just a waste of paper. You know, I, uh, I can't summon that visceral fire up within me that I get with certain books. This is just like, yeah, it's uh, stupid, and it's, it's a mess. You know, they, there's no better word for it. It is a fucking mess. It feels like a first draft, which was written by like seven different people, all trying to cram their own ideas in there, and it was never cleaned up in any way. The most fun I had with it was reading a couple of those dumb, funny lines that I read to you guys. Other than that, I was just kind of like, yeah, okay, let's, let's get this over with, or I was bored. I wasn't necessarily bored the whole time, but I wasn't like into it that much. I was just going through the motions of reading it. I, I'll admit I did finish it eh, fairly quick. I think it was 10 or 11 days, so like a week and a half, and this is around 550 pages, so that's that's a decent pace, which is hard for me to do when I truly think something is boring and terrible. So, I mean, I guess there's that. You know, it's not confusing the way it's written, for the most part. Like, at times, for the most part, I would say it's average, which is not exactly praise, but, you know, there's only a few points where it dips below that. And overall, like, I can't say I'm that surprised, because... I didn't really read or watch any reviews of this before I filmed this. I'll, I'm probably going to go out and watch some now because I'm curious how other people feel. But, like, what did you expect from a YouTuber's book? You know, I, I think by now uh, we've started to realize that once you reach a certain level of fame, you are pretty much guaranteed to sell at least a little bit. Like, this book probably sold decently well, even with the shitty reviews. Uh, I can't say that for certain. I, I don't know. Like, it says number one New York Times best-selling authors Sasha Alsberg and Lindsay Cummings, but maybe that's for other stuff. Oh, hey, fun fact. On the cover of this book, there is a review from Sarah J. Moss saying it's a whirlwind of out-of-this-galaxy adventure, which is uh, not exactly glowing praise coming from her. But overall, yeah, I just... I don't think they had much of a chance to make this work anyways. Like, I'll, pretty much every YouTuber book that's ever come out has been absolute shit and one day someone will probably break that cycle but it hasn't happened today and i don't think there's any greater point i can glean from that just that zenith is not very good i didn't like it don't read it don't waste your time on it ah uh yeah, okay um pa patreon pa patrons uh give people money um the ten dollar and up uh we have oppo savalane and olivia ray and ava tumor brother santotis christopher quinten deanna dayhem embis joel Kark, cat kitsune kevin Zhang, 
Liza Rudakova, Madison Lewis Bennett, Microphone, Sad Mardigan, Tobacco Crow, Tom Beanie, Vey, Victus. You guys are all cool. Other names are, um, you, you're also awesome. I couldn't, I couldn't do this without you. I swear you guys are the best. I, I love you so much. You, please, thank you for watching. If you, uh, donate to my Patreon, you get, uh, rewards and, and stuff. Uh, if you like video, comment, subscribe, and uh, follow me on social. Uh, goodbye.